two Soviet MiG-23s were given target destruct orders on a U.S. Navy EP-3. Our commanding general ordered a flight of four F-15s to go intercept the MiG-23s. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. The year 1983 was one of the most dangerous in human history. While the Cuban crisis was exceptionally dangerous and both the United States and the Soviet Union had significant nuclear arsenals in 1962... A war in 1983 would have likely ended the human race. Brian Mora was Chief of Intelligence Analysis for US Forces Japan at Yokota Air Base when on the 1st of September 1983 an unarmed Korean airliner was shot down by a Soviet fighter causing the deaths of 269 people. He describes the less well-known subsequent incidents between the Soviet and US military aircraft which almost resulted in a shooting war between the two superpowers. During this period, the Soviet leadership believed the US was going to launch a nuclear attack on their country. Their paranoia was heightened by several incidents during 1983 which are dramatised in Bryan's new novel, The Able Archers, which is based on his experiences during this period. Robert M. Gates, former CIA director and Secretary of Defense, describes the Able Archers as a powerful reminder of the value of human judgment and the continuing perils posed by nuclear armed powers. Now, I could really use your support to continue the podcast. A simple monthly donation will get you the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are preserving Cold War history. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Brian Mora to our Cold War Conversation. In 1983, I was a, I was a captain in the U S air force. And I was stationed at, um, the headquarters of U S forces in Japan, which is located at Yokota air base in the Western suburbs of Japan. Uh, yeah, it's about 25 miles from downtown Tokyo, something like that. And, uh, there's actually another headquarters located there, which is, uh, the headquarters of fifth air force. And, uh, I was the chief of intelligence analysis at the time for both Fifth Air Force and U.S. Forces Japan, effectively. I was in charge of a, a number of intelligence analysts, most of whom had a very strong signals intelligence background, but it was a melange of people with different backgrounds. I had people working for me who had human intelligence backgrounds, imagery intelligence, uh, and we were an all source intelligence activity, which was seeking to fuse all different types of intelligence. And the countries that we were, we were focused on were the Soviet union, uh, specifically the Soviet far East, Far Eastern Military District, uh, North Korea, and the People's Republic of China. So I, I had desk officers for the PRC, for North Korea, and for the Soviet Union that worked for me. Uh, but I was in charge of the overall operation. So that's that's where I was and what I was doing in 83. And I can get into more detail about how that related to the events as, as you like. Absolutely. Would, would like to um, explore that further. Now, the book that you've written, The Able Archers, 
is based on real events. It's based, some of it's based on your experience. I think one of the, the main characters is partly your experiences and obviously part part fictional. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, and that, that proved uh, to be a little bit of a challenge in writing the book, but uh, it actually... The, the more I, I wrote and, and the better I got, I think, at writing, it became less of a challenge. But uh, yes, that is true. And the, and the character, there are two main characters in the book, and each of them takes turns providing first person narration. So that's the that's the method I used. And the American character who is who is based on me is named uh, Kevin Katani. He's a captain in Air Force Intelligence. Um, and I chose his name with purpose because my last name, Mora, is uh, is of Italian heritage. And my first name, Brian, is obviously Celtic. And so I wanted a, a, a name. I wanted that character's name to be a Celtic first name and a, an Italian last name. And Katani happens to be a, a, another name in my family's background. So that's how I chose his his name, and then the the other main character is uh, an older man at the time of the Able Archers, and he's a Soviet GRU military intelligence officer, and his he's a full colonel at the time of this book, and his name is Ivan Levchenko, and I, I chose that name for a couple of reasons. One, I thought that it would be relatively easy, or easy for non-Russian speakers to get their tongues around and their minds around. And um, Levchenko actually was the surname of a, of a Soviet KGB officer that I knew who defected to the United States. And I, I worked with Levchenko when, uh, a bit later in the period after the Able Archers. So that's how I chose those, those characters' names. The the book opens with the the 1983 incident in the area that you were you were working in. So, from what I understand, there was a, a large American exercise in a sea off the coast of the Soviet Union, and there was an incident where some U.S. Navy aircraft inadvertently overflew Soviet territory. Is that correct? Yes, uh, it wasn't clear to me at the time and still is not entirely clear whether it was inadvertent or not. <laughs> I was being diplomatic, Brian. You, know? you were indeed. Um, and you're, you're right, that uh, exercise, which was called Fleet X-83, was the largest, my understanding at least, is that it was the largest exercise the U.S. Pacific Fleet conducted during the entire Cold War. And what it consisted of was sending three carrier battle groups, which consisted of over 40 ships and hundreds of aircraft in total, three carrier battle groups uh, up into the Sea of Okhotsk, which is part of the North Pacific, but it's almost like an inland sea in a sense. And the, and the Soviet Union then and the Russians today consider the Sea of Okhotsk to be an inland sea in effect. It's bounded by the Siberian landmass to the north and, and the northwest and on the east by the Kamchatka Peninsula and then to the south by the Kuril Island chain, which the Soviet Union seized from Japan at the end of World War II. Uh, and Sakhalin Island to the west. So it is bounded by Soviet territory, which is a reason they consider it their lake. It's also uh, considered then and today as a bastion for Soviet and Russian ballistic missile submarines to hide in, which essentially have intercontinental ballistic missiles on board, spend m most of their time at sea hiding from attack submarines of the other side. And the Sea of Okhotsk is considered one of those bastion areas, both by the Soviet Union back in those days and the uh, and Russia today for their ballistic missile submarine fleets. 
and the incident that you're describing, the, the U.S. Navy overflight of Soviet territory took place at the end of that exercise, Fleet X-83, and the exercise itself took place in late March and early April of 1983. Um, the overflight took place on the 4th of April of 1983, and it consisted of F-14s and F-4 fighters from two of the carriers that were in that exercise, the two of the carrier battle groups, as the exercise was winding down, exited the Sea of Okhotsk through the Kuril Island chain on their way back to uh, the port of Yokosuka in Japan. And it was during that transit of the Kuril Islands that, um, yes, F-14s and F-4s um, overflew Soviet territory and uh, the F-4s at least conducted practice mock bomb runs on Soviet military facilities, which leads one to believe that it may not have been inadvertent, but was a provocative act. And the, the Soviet Union considered all of Fleet X-83 to be an enormously provocative act. And this occurred uh, at a time when the Soviet Union was conducting the largest intelligence operation of the Cold War, uh, which had kicked off a couple of years prior to these events in 1983. And the, the, the intelligence project was called Operation Ryan. And Ryan is a Russian acronym that stands for uh, nuclear rocket attack. Uh, so any provocations that the United States or NATO or other countries uh, perpetrated against the Soviet Union during that period of time uh, were perceived to be indications of uh, supporting the, the notion that the, the West was preparing to conduct a first strike nuclear attack on the Soviet Union and that was the whole purpose of Ryan, Operation Ryan, was to look for indications of a first strike. And so a, a provocative act like Fleet X-83 and an even more provocative act like overflying their territory with combat aircraft was seen by the Kremlin and, and by the KGB and the GRU as indicators of, of an intent to provoke the Soviet Union into an incident that might give the West an excuse for conducting a nuclear first strike. Which you can completely understand if they're doing mock bombing runs as well. I mean, I'm struggling to think of a, a time when uh, NATO would have infringed Soviet airspace to that degree beyond sort of like the U2 period. To my knowledge, certainly in the 1970s and 80s, I, I, I'm not aware of any similar action on the part of the United States or any of the allies. It was reckless, to put it mildly. And the, the Soviets um, reacted with vigor in that um, they conducted after that event in April, early April of 1983, the Soviet Far Eastern Military District conducted a purge of air defense officers in the region uh, because they had permitted this overflight and they permitted this overflight to occur unchallenged. The Soviet Air Defense Forces had a MiG-23 interceptor base in the Kuril Island chain and none of those MiG-23s managed to get off the ground while this overflight was taking place. Um, so you can imagine that heads rolled. The other part of their response, the Soviet response to that event was to, they themselves get very, very provocative in terms of how they were intercepting our intelligence collection flights um, in the Far East both by the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy and to some degree by the Japanese as well. So it was, a, it was an event that triggered uh, a series of events that played out during the, 
course of the rest of the year of 1983. And cause an event with a large loss of life, which we'll we'll come on to in a moment. One of the scenes that you describe in the book is is one of these intelligence aircraft being intercepted by Soviet fighters in international airspace. And I was I was going to ask you, is that that's based on a, a true event or true events that th- this sort of thing happened where the Soviets got really threatening close to U.S. intelligence aircraft. Yes, it, it happened every day uh, that there were close intercepts, especially after the fourth of April. After that event, that U.S. Navy overflight. Typically, if the Russians really want to show hostile intent, they'll get very close and they'll also arm their missiles like they're about to fire. So that was definitely happening. We saw this. Uh, in April of 1983, an exponential increase in the number of intercepts against our intelligence collection aircraft, and not only in the number, but also in the uh, evidence of hostile intent, where they would arm their missiles, they would do things of that nature. And so my analytical team and I were we were watching all of this occur. And as I point out in the book, or I have a scene in the book where um, Captain Katani and his commanding general go to Hawaii and brief the commander in chief of the entire Pacific command on these events. And that uh, Katani is asked for a bottom line by the four-star admiral. And his bottom line is essentially that any any aircraft that the Soviets believe is violating their border is at great risk of being shot down. In in real life, I did give that briefing to the commander in chief of the Pacific, and it was just it was just uh, I gave that briefing only four or five weeks before the Korean airliner was shot down. Wow! Wow! That incident. In itself, because, you know, none of the the Soviet air defense commanders wanted to be the one that let an aircraft overfly from then on. So they were particularly trigger, well, not necessarily trigger happy, but certainly threatening to prevent that. And obviously with the Korean airliner KAL-007, that to the Soviets would have looked like potentially through its radar signature, I guess, that it was a, an RC-135. What happened that night, and I was on duty that night, and I relay that story through Katani's eyes, was that the Soviets had planned to conduct an ICBM test uh, from Central Asia, and those ICBMs would be flown out to the North Pacific and they would, there was a landing area for those, um, those, the ICBM dummy warheads in the sea, the Northern Pacific off the coast of Kamchatka Peninsula between um, Kamchatka and, and Alaska. And that night, because we were anticipating an ICBM launch the U.S. Air Force had an RC-135 orbiting over that re-entry area of the Pacific. And this is a specially outfitted RC-135 that has a lot of equipment on board to collect missile telemetry. And uh, so there was, in fact, an RC-135 in the area. And just coincidentally, uh, KAL-007 on its errant flight path through flew right through the orbital area that the RC-135 was taking that night. Um, as it happens, the Soviets canceled their ICBM launch that night. We don't know why. It was not that uncommon. It wasn't. It wasn't peculiar for them to cancel such a a launch, but in any event, it didn't occur. And the RC-135 then left its orbit and flew back to Alaska 
flew back to Shemya Air Base in the, in the Aleutian Islands. And KL-007 just continued on its merry way. <laughs> and it would have been, it would not have been unusual for Soviet radar operators to confuse the two. And um, Soviet long-range radars, surveillance radars, were not particularly accurate in any event. So I, I, it's my view that the Soviet air defense um, operators on Kamchatka were confused that night. And they it, their assumption was, well, this it, it can't be an airliner because it, we're too far north for any of the Trans-Pacific airline routes. So it must, this, this mystery airplane uh, must be an RC-135. So the, the Soviets send up some fighters to intercept it. I mean, I've, you know, never flown a fighter, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand how you would mistake a Boeing 747 for a U.S. Uh, reconnaissance aircraft because they it would still have been illuminated in some way at night wouldn't it the tail at least or not yes and what happened that night was that the soviets did they did launch fighters from kamchatka uh from their bases around petropavlovsk and they never intercepted the the aircraft um and so they failed to intercept it. And then the aircraft flew, generally speaking, over Petropavlovsk, which is a, which was then and is now uh, a, an important naval base for the uh, Pacific Fleet. Um, and it is the home of ballistic missile submarines, which are super, super secret, right? And especially during the Soviet days. So this flight route went over Kamchatka. They, the Soviet air defense fighters failed to intercept over Kamchatka. The flight continued across the Sea of Okhotsk, the same body of water where Fleet X-83 had occurred and earlier in the year. And um, it was, the aircraft was not reacquired by Soviet radars until it approached Sakhalin Island all the way on the other side of the Sea of Okhotsk. And it was, to your point, Ian, uh, fighters were launched from bases on Sakhalin, from two different bases on Sakhalin Island that night, to intercept this mystery airplane. And uh, one fighter did effect an intercept. Uh, The fighter was a Sukhoi-15, which um, was a fighter interceptor that was fairly commonly used by the Soviets at that time. It was being phased out, but it was still a fairly capable fighter. Didn't have a particularly great radar, but it did, it did affect the intercept. And to your question, uh, couldn't a fighter pilot identify or tell the difference between a 707 and a Boeing 707 and a Boeing 747, even at night? The answer is yes. They can, and the air and the KAL 007 was flying with its navigation lights illuminated. And in fact, the Soviet pilot, a Major Osipovich, who uh, intercepted Flight 007, did identify it as a 747. And because of its unique feature of having two rows of, of, uh, of windows um, on the fuselage, and and some of those windows were illuminated because some passengers were had their lights on to read or what have you. So he did when he got down on the ground. He told his uh, commanders that it was the seven four seven. So he didn't notify them before he opened fire. Then that uh, it was a seven four seven. Yeah, it's a great question. As far as we know, that is correct. He did not tell them that. He did not tell them. And and as I try to describe in the in the Able Archers, his intercept of KL 7 did not go all that smoothly. 
and it was a very challenging operation. And as soon as he got into a firing position on the target, he just let his missiles go. And um, because he was he had target destruct orders and he was going to destroy the target no matter what it was. It was a border violator and it needed to be shot down in their view. And it did it. As you pointed out, there was a great loss of life. There were 269 people on board, passengers and crew, including over 60 American citizens and including a United States congressman, um, which led some to believe in the States that this was an assassination attempt on that congressman. But that's that's not the case. But there were still some who believe that. Uh, so, yes, those are those are the circumstances of that of that night and, and the intercept and, and the destruction of the aircraft took place just after 3 a.m. local time. Flying conditions were not bad that night. So he was able to do the, the Soviet pilot was able to do a visual inspection of the aircraft and he did fire tracer rounds in front of the nose of the aircraft to try to get its attention. He had no, means of being able to communicate with the with the civilian aircraft by radio. Uh, so firing tracer rounds was about the best he could do at night. Um, and, and the crew would not have noticed the presence of this fighter uh, near them unless they were specifically looking for it, you know, more than likely at night. So it, uh, that combination of factors led to this tragic event. And in your your position in Japan, are you are you hearing the communications in real time, or is it dribs and drabs of information that come in as the night goes on that you realise that there's been this disaster? Right, um, and I should point out at this time, especially for uh, listeners who've had security clearances <laughs> in the past, this book and other books I've written in the series um, have all been approved for publication by the office of the secretary of defense in the Pentagon, which also farmed, I know they farmed this book out to a number of intelligence agencies uh, to gain their approval. So everything I've talked about in this conversation and everything I've talked about in the book was, has been cleared um, for release. So we, one of the, I think one of the things that I hope comes through in the book and the description of that night was how, how confusing it was for us. Uh, we didn't know what we were dealing with. Uh, and the Soviets didn't really know what they were dealing with. Um, at that it's, it's, one has to put oneself back into that time, 1983, and there was no GPS there. Uh, there were no, there was no radar coverage, um, across the Pacific Ocean, um, the communications that aircraft enjoyed with uh, with ground control, whether it was in Alaska or in Japan, uh, were very rudimentary. And once um, once an aircraft like KL zero zero seven passed the last U.S. Air Force radar station on the west coast of Alaska. Um, all of those aircraft flying the great circle route across the Pacific ocean were on their own and they, they couldn't expect any navigational help from anyone on the ground or from satellites or all the sort of things we take for granted today. They just didn't exist then. When you look at it from today's view, you think, well, how could that flight have been so far off course? But, but then you know, you think about that plane that just completely disappeared and still not found that when was that 10, probably less than 10 years ago or something. I can't remember the, the day it, it's a big ocean out there. Or it's a big landmass out there. Right. And it probably looks pretty much the same when you're that high up. And, and Ian, if I may, I, I, I just, I didn't want to lose the thread on one question you asked earlier, which was about that one incident where, there was hostile intent on the Soviets part against a U.S. intelligence collection aircraft. Um, that incident actually, that did happen. 
Um, that and to my mind, um, I've never seen it in any of the books or anything, uh, any accounts of the Korean airline disaster. Um, but I, I was present for all of that, so I know I know it did happen, and uh, I was I was pleasantly surprised that um, I was allowed to publish it in this book because I think it it it's a it's an incident that, and I'll describe it in a moment if you like, but it's an incident that gives us pause for what's going on today. Um, miscalculation, misidentification, things can, things can go wrong and they can cause a big problem for us. The, the incident that I describe in the book occurred about 36 hours after the Korean airliner was shot down. And the crash site of the of KL 007 was in a in a small body of water, a narrow body of water, between Sakhalin Island and the Siberian mainland, the far eastern mainland, and that small body of water became extremely crowded with Soviet Navy ships, U.S. Navy ships, even some U.S. Coast Guard ships, Japanese ships. And the airspace over and around the crash site became very, very crowded with Soviet uh, intel collectors with search and rescue planes from both the Soviet Union and the United States, intel collection aircraft from both sides, and fighters, uh, fighters from the Soviet Union. And the United States had fighters flying combat air patrol over the northern island of Japan, Hokkaido, uh, that were positioned in such a way that they could, they could get to the crash site very quickly if they needed to. And as it turned out on the afternoon of the 3rd of September, the the KAL shoot down took place in the early morning hours of the 1st of September. The incident occurred on the afternoon of the 3rd of September where the Soviet, two Soviet MiG 23s, were given target destruct orders on a U.S. Navy EP-3. And EP-3s were the intelligence collection version of the P-3 aircraft, which m- most people know more commonly as a sub-hunter. The, P- the, reg- the regular P-3, if you will, was a sub-hunter. The EP-3 was uh, an intelligence collection aircraft that had uh, a crew of about two dozen people. And the, so the MiG-23 with threes, the flight of two, were given target destruct orders, and they went out to intercept the EP-3. And we knew that the MiG-23s had target destruct orders. So from our command center at Yokota Air Base in Japan, we alerted the P-3 to take evasive action. And uh, really the only evasive action that those planes could take, they were flying their nominal altitude would be about 25,000 feet. The only evasive action they could take would be to dive from 25,000 feet straight to the wave tops and try to pull the airplane out of the dive before they crashed into the sea. And that's what they did that day. And the MiG 23s followed them down, followed the EP three down, but uh, lost them, lost the P-3, and probably because the Soviet radars really didn't have what we called a look-down, shoot-down capability at that time. Suffice to say, their radars weren't that good, so they lost the EP-3 probably in the wave clutter. When you get down close to the ocean, there's a lot of uh, clutter for a radar to deal with coming off the waves. So Thankfully, the EP-3 got away. But in the meantime, because these MiG-23s had target destruct orders, just like the Su-15 had two nights earlier on the KL-007, our commanding general ordered a flight of of four F-15s to go intercept the MiG-23s, which they did do. And they, they intercepted them successfully and were in a position to shoot them down when our commanding general called them back, called the F-15s back, once he knew that the EP-3 was safe 
um, with his famous words that I quote in the book, I'm not going to, I'm not starting world war three this afternoon. So, and he really did say that and he pulled them back and, um, it's with respect to what's going on today in the skies around Ukraine, you could see how an event like the one that happened in September of 1983 might happen again. And you could have um, shots fired between NATO combat aircraft and Russian combat aircraft uh, flying in the constrained space, like over the Black Sea. I mean, it must have been really tense because that you you were hearing your aircraft in real time. You knew that these intercept orders had been issued. Well, you were potentially watching a war start. Yes, exactly correct. And it uh, it was it got it, it was very very uh, as you say tense. And and I I, I think I. I don't remember exactly how I wrote it in the book, but as that's, as it became clear that we wouldn't have a shooting event at that time, the, the atmosphere in that command center just went from one of extreme anxiety to one of extreme relief quite quickly. But then the bizarre thing that happened that same afternoon was that uh, a Japanese television airplane an NHK plane, which in NHK, for those of you who don't know, is in Japan is analogous to the BBC in the UK. And so NHK was flying uh, uh, because they were trying to take pictures of the crash site and, um, and there was debris on the water surface and so on. And the Soviet air defense system identified the NHK plane as a border violator. Um, which is also why they tried to shoot down the EP3. They misidentified it as a border violator. They did the same thing about two hours later with this NHK plane, and they sent two two different MiG-23s up to shoot that plane down. And that situation was diffused by a young Russian pilot who's anonymous to history, who he was the flight lead of those two MiG-23s, he identified the aircraft correctly as a civilian television plane. And uh, he basically said, are you sure you want me to shoot this down? And they said, yes, we're sure it's a border violator. You have your order, shoot it down. And, and this young pilot then responded, uh, I'm, we're low on fuel or we're returning to base. <laughs> and, Gosh. and that really, wow. too. And, and, I mean, it, it was in the atmosphere in the command center when that occurred was, I would describe as surreal. I mean, it was just a couple of hours earlier, we felt like we dodged this rather important bullet in, in getting the EP3 getting uh, out of harm's way uh, and safely back to Japan. Um, and then two hours later, we have another incident that, who knows what would have happened had those May 23s shot down that, um, that NHK plane and our commanding general did send F 15s, uh, again to intercept the May 23s. So we could have had a shooting war had that, that NHK plane been shot down hard to know, but it was, it was a fraught time. With the uh, reconnaissance aircraft, I think you you talk about the uh, the the U.S. pilots having like firing solutions for the MiG twenty three, and they're saying we w- you know we can get them now. We can we can get them. Right. And the the general tells the or the the general doesn't directly tell them, but obviously via somebody else tells them to basically return. And I think in in the book you say um, that he says, and make sure that they repeat back that instruction so that we know that they've understood that. He did do that, yeah, he did, and and they, yes, and the and the flight lead did repeat that instruction back, and he was he was not happy. He was an Air Force major, and he he they were their blood was up, and they'd just seen 
the Soviets nearly shoot down this defenseless EP3, which was not violating the Soviet border. And their blood was up. Uh, and fortunately, cooler heads prevailed. Yeah. And as you say, this was only 36, 48 hours after the airliner had been right. shot down as well. So, I mean, the the General Charles L. Donnelly Jr. sounds like an incredible guy. And, and you work quite closely with him, I understand. I did. And uh, we became very close um, uh, on a more personal level, actually, but it, which was really unusual for uh, a young officer like, like I was, in fact, when I first, um, when I first started briefing him, I, I would often do the morning intelligence briefings myself. I was, I was still a first Lieutenant. He promoted me to captain, um, himself. And, uh, yeah, we were quite close and we did, yeah, I traveled with him, uh, to Korea and as well as Hawaii. And, and he, he uh, had a lot of faith in my judgment, which, which said a lot. I, I'm not sure that it was completely well-founded, but <laughs> he did have that. And, um, and then, yes, we remain close uh, the rest of his life, uh, which unfortunately was cut short at age 64 by cancer. But um, yeah, he was, he was quite a guy. You dedicate, the book to the memory of three men who were instrumental in preventing war in 1983. One is Donnelly. Donnelly I hadn't heard of. The other two I had heard of. I think it'd be worth talking about about them. Should we start with Stanislav Petrov? Because uh, he is um, known as the man who saved the world. Yes, and I, Stanislav Petrov, uh, for those of you who don't know, and I suspect many on this broadcast will know him, but he, at the time of the events of 1983, he was a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he was an Air Defense Forces officer. Uh, he had a technical background. He had graduated from the Kiev uh, Air Force Academy, which was known uh, for being a very fine engineering school. And, uh, and Petrov at the time in, in September of 1983 was assigned to the National Missile, Missile Defense Center, which is located about a one, roughly 100 kilometers south of uh, Moscow. And the National Missile Defense Center's role in the Soviet, in the air defense of the, the homeland, the air and missile defense of the homeland, was to be a, a big fusion center, um, an intelligence fusion center, effectively for monitoring potential air and missile threats to the Soviet homeland. Uh, so, amongst their um, responsibilities, would have been uh, monitoring United States ICBM launches and um, any missile activity that might um, pose a threat to the Soviet Union. Uh, and Petrov was a technical officer. He was, at the time, um, in 1983, he was the deputy chief of algorithm development for the National Missile Defense Center. So I imagine he had a team of of technical people, signal processing people, software to, people working for him and uh uh he the the event that i describe in the book which is the second of three major events that take place in the fall of 1983 took place in uh, moscow time in the early early morning hours of the 27th of september uh so not quite four weeks after the korean airline shoot down and petrov was on duty um, as watch officer on the on the overnight shift uh, only because another officer had fallen ill. Petrov didn't routinely stand watch duty because that wasn't his job. Um, and but he happened to be called in that night, and uh, the world 
is very fortunate that it was Stanislav Petrov who was on duty that night and not some other officer who might have made different calculations about what he was seeing um, and what his team ought to do about it. But what they did see shortly after midnight on the 27th of September 1983 was that the uh, missile defense, missile warning satellites that the Soviets had put up a year earlier, which were known as by the name OKO, and many of you know that means I in Russian, but the, any, in any event, that shortly after midnight, there were indications of a, launches of ICBMs in several waves coming from Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota in the United States. And they were um, successive waves. There were three waves of launches and the satellite processing systems were assessing that uh, there was a high degree of confidence that these were actually ICBM launches. And Petrov, again, the algorithm developer and the expert on these signals um, didn't believe it. And he stood his ground and he uh, ultimately made the right call that these were all false alarms, even though the, these waves, successive waves took over, took place over the course of 20 minutes or so, um, 25 minutes maybe. And it, it, it was, had to be an extremely difficult decision for him to make, but he, he made the right call. And in the book, my fictional character, Colonel, Ivan Levchenko is visiting the National Missile Defense Center at the time. And uh, in the book, I have him uh, be a, an old friend and classmate of Petrov's from the Kiev Air Force Academy. So Levchenko is actually present in the National Missile Defense Center the night of this incident. And you see it through Levchenko's eyes. And uh, I, I hope that puts the the reader really kind of in Levchenko's shoes watching uh, an event that nearly led to an intercontinental nuclear war. Those 20 minutes must have seemed like an age yeah. in terms of just seeing, you know, the, um, I presume the screens continually say there's a launch and just hold, holding your, your nerve there. I mean, I, you, you just can't imagine the the pressure that he, he would have been under and his career suffered afterwards. It did. And uh, he was chastised on a couple of technicalities, one of which was not keeping an accurate log <laughs> of the event during the event. Um, and I, one suspects that uh, Colonel Petrov had other things on his mind than making notes at the time. Um, he was scrambling to, see if there were uh, any other uh, of their surveillance sources was indicating anything similar to what the OCO satellites were reporting. He was, he was a busy man, I'm quite sure. And then, but his real crime uh, was really revealing that the OCO satellites were not quite ready for operational use. And that embarrassed a lot of, people that were senior to him in the chain of command and and senior senior to him in the Russian military industrial complex as well. And he never got promoted again and he left the air defense forces as a broken man. And if if any of you've seen any clips of Petrov late in life, he's extremely bitter and it's a real shame. But um he and he died in 2017, I believe. But in later life, his contribution was recognized, albeit outside of Russia and the former Soviet Union. It, it, it was, and uh, and I, I don't think, in some respects, he's received the recognition he's due. I, I think Europe has been kinder to him than the United States. I think I think the Petrov incident. And his role is better known, generally speaking, in Europe and in the UK than it is in the United States. Um, and 
it's 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 a bit of a shame because he really he he did save the world <laughs> that night and uh um and the west was another interesting point about this is that the soviets didn't never revealed that since it took place and it was termed very uh you know, top secret i'm sure they put it in a special access program and so forth um but it, it was finally revealed by a general officer who was in Petrov's chain of command at the time. Um, and he wrote a memoir that was published in the late 1990s. And one of the chapters in his book was called The Man Who Saved the World. And, and he describes the Petrov incident. And I think that book was first translated from Russian into German and uh, it, it, I don't know if it was ever translated into, in, into English, but in any event, the world became aware um, only many years after the event. Incredible, incredible. And what was the, the malfunction? Did they think that the sun, was it the sun reflecting? Or I, I read somewhere that was... Yeah, that's right, Ian. And what the, the Soviets, after this incident occurred... Um, embarked on a, <clears throat> on a very serious uh, study of how did this happen? And uh, they looked, wanted to determine um, if there was a malfunction with the OCO satellites, if there was some problem with the, either the sensors themselves or with the signal processing or what have you. And so after an exhaustive uh, study of the problem, they finally determined that what caused the problem was a rather, if not unique, highly unusual atmospheric event um, over uh, the Grand Forks Air Force Base region where um, there was a, a very strange meteorological event in the high atmosphere that um, caused the sun's rays to bounce in a very odd fashion back off the atmosphere into space. And uh, apparently to the OCO satellite system, these returns looked to all the world for all the world like ICBM launches. Um, so it was a strange meteorological set of conditions that led to this. I, I, I don't know for a fact, but I, I suspect the Soviets made some adjustments to the OCO satellites, either the sensors themselves for later generation of satellites or the certainly to the signal processing so that there would be less likelihood of something like this happening again. And you just, one can just imagine had, had the West known of this event at the time, um, the reaction, it, it one, uh, because peace during the Cold War, to a large degree, relied on the sense of a nuclear balance and the sense that of that each side is a rational actor and that each side is going to behave rationally around decisions associated with their nuclear forces. And this um, event would have had it become widely known during the cold war would have eroded confidence in that sense of balance one would think to put it probably to put it mildly <laughs> i imagine there there would have been a public outcry if this had if it had come out in the newspapers and radio and television at the time that this had occurred i can just imagine it would have been people would have been horrified yeah. Well, it's also, you know, if if we'd known about Operation Rian and what they were what they were trying to do with that, because I mean, right, you know that that thought that they that the Soviets thought that the Americans were seriously considering a first strike would have, well, it would have more than shocked people. Yes, it, exactly right, and and it, it was Oleg Gordievsky, the KGB officer who was spying for. MI6, who um, revealed the existence of Operation Ryan during the fall of 1983. And 
I, I CIA um, was given this, given the information by MI6 and CIA didn't really believe it. Um, because it just seemed so fabulous. So incredible that the leadership in the Kremlin would have such a view um, uh, in their, in our minds, a perverted, distorted view. Um, but they did. But I guess, you know, they're in their own echo chamber. They're surrounded by yes men. And that seems to be a logical view of the world to them. Um, but obviously not to us. The, the third person that you uh, dedicate the book to is um, Leonard Perutz. Now, uh, what can you say about him? Well, unlike Petrov, uh, I did know Lenny Perutz and um, I worked for him for a time. And General Perutz was another very impressive individual, uh, much like Chuck Donnelly in some ways, uh, very different personality types. Um, Lenny Perutz was one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. He was an astonishing joke teller and um, could get a, a conference of room of 2000 people rolling in the aisles laughing. He, he was, he could have been a stand up comic. Um, he was, but that, uh, outward manifestation, some people underestimated him because he was so funny, uh, but he had a very keen mind and very, he, he had a deep knowledge of the Soviets and a deep knowledge um, that was um, tempered by a, also, or, or by a, a mind that, um, was willing to accept new concepts and new thoughts readily. He was very, he was the kind of person you want as an intelligence leader uh, because of those traits. Uh, and, uh, and he was really the individual who not quite single-handedly, but um, he was the key individual in diffusing the final crisis of 1983, which was, really the most dangerous one, um, it, and which was precipitated by NATO's able, able Archer 83 nuclear exercise. Um, and what Leonard Perutz saw, and again, because he had deep knowledge of Soviets and how they had historically operated, especially in the forward areas of uh, the Warsaw Pact, he immediately saw that the way they were behaving, the way the Soviets were behaving in response to Able Archer 83 was not only highly unusual, it was incredibly frightening. And the preparations that the Soviets were making for nuclear war and for conventional war in early November of 1983 were unlike anything else we ever saw during the cold war, um, including during the Cuban missile crisis. And, um, uh, Perutz was observing these things and, and reported accordingly to his leadership and to the NATO leadership. And, um, he was asked, well, should we respond in kind? Should we increase our nuclear alert status? And, really instinctually Perutz said, no, he said, no, don't. It'll only antagonize the Soviets. It could make things much worse. And let's also think about winding down this Able Archer 83 exercise, uh, maybe a little bit more rapidly than we planned to. And Perutz, it's a testament to him because he was, he was a one-star general at the time, which, amongst generals is pretty low down the pecking order. It, it is the bottom of the pecking order, in fact. But um, he, he was able to convince these four stars uh, and, and NATO's civilian leadership that the right course of action was inaction and was to, in this instance, to take no action in effect and other than maybe winding the exercise up a little bit more rapidly. 
Uh, and he was, he was correct because the Soviets took those, our non-reaction as a positive thing. Uh, and even though the Soviet alert posture didn't uh, recede immediately, it didn't recede with the end of Able Archer 83, it did gradually unwind over the course of several months uh, so that by the time uh, Yuri Andropov, who was running the Soviet Union at the time, or the lead guy anyway, by the time he died in the spring, March, I think, of 84, things were really beginning, really, things had kind of unwound and, and the, the acute crisis had ended by that time. So Perutz, I think, is, is an historical figure of importance. And um, he famously, he, he later got promoted to be the chief of Air Force Intelligence in the Pentagon. And that's where I worked for him and came to know him. After that, he was promoted to be director of defense intelligence agency, which is the three-star position. And uh, when he, when he retired from the air force, retired as director of DIA, he wrote a very extensive end of tour report. And in that report, he, uh, even though he wrote the report in 1989, when he retired, he wrote a great deal about Abel Archer and about those events in the fall of 1983. And uh, he was very critical in his end of tour report over the fact that CIA had not informed him of this intelligence from Gordievsky. And that in the absence of that knowledge, he was making decisions blindly. He didn't know about Perutz had no knowledge of Operation Ryan. He did not know um, uh, uh, of the degree of Soviet paranoia in the Kremlin. And it, and it was both of those things that Gordievsky was reporting to MI6, he, the existence and the extent of Ryan and the persistence and the depth of paranoia among the Kremlin leadership. Those are the main things that Gordievsky communicated to MI6 that fall. And none of that information ever got to Lenny Perutz. And Perutz was, when he learned about it later, he was pretty unhappy about it. And he felt that, you know, I made the, I, I ended up making the right decision about Abel Archer and about the Soviet posture, but it would have been nice to have this additional information to make it with. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So he, Absolutely. And I, and that end of tour report of, of uh, General Perutz was very highly classified and it remained classified until February of 2021. And it was only in February of last year that the National Security Archive at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. managed to uh, finally get that report released it's it's redacted. I've read it. It's redacted, but in spots. But you get you get the gist of it. Um, so it, it, he's a remarkable figure in history and should re be remembered as such. I think. Absolutely. Uh, did you have access to information such as the military liaison missions in East Germany? Did they see an increased readiness there as well? Yes, they did. Uh, so Perutz and, and Lenny Perutz was getting that information firsthand. Um, I know one of the things uh, he liked to do was he, he would like to talk to the collectors. So um, folks like the military liaison mission in Berlin um, were, they were out in the field during Able Archer 83 in East Germany and, and they were collecting information on this nuclear alert posture uh, that the Soviets were undertaking. And that, that, day, that info was definitely getting back to General Perutz. And they we're also relying on overhead imagery and other, and, and signals intelligence, of course. Um, the, the United States and the British in particular had very robust signals intelligence operations um, located in West Berlin, uh, 
that could collect really terrific uh, real-time intelligence on what the Soviets were up to on the other side of the wall and, and throughout East Germany. So all of those sources of information, but the MLM definitely was was part of that mosaic. Your book goes through the um, the three main flashpoints of 1983 i found it really interesting looking at it from from the points of views that you've got there in terms of you know trying to put you in the shoes of the people who were there at the time um which is one of the things i try and do with the podcast is try and interview people who who were there at the time but obviously there's a number of situations where i can't you know i can't do that i'm i'm really pleased to be able to speak to you about what it was like in japan after the uh, the fleet exercise and the uh, the KAL um, shoot down, that was really in, enlightening. But I, I found the book really enjoyable. So um, thank you for you know for for putting that together. I mean, because you'd experienced the the incidents off uh, Japan, you felt that this history needed to be told in in some way, in a different way to the way that had been done before. Because a number of books came out about 1983 about four or five years ago, I think. 2018, yes. You, you felt it needed a, a different approach in some way. I did. And uh, Taylor Downing, who is um, also is a British historian and journalist, and he wrote what I believe is the best book, best nonfiction book on the events of 1983, uh, which is called if I get it right, I hope I do for Taylor's benefit here, 1983, A World on the Brink, Reagan and a Drop-Off, A World on the Brink. I think that's the title of it. Yeah, and it's a, it's a very fine book and was kind enough to read The Able Archers, and he wrote me a wonderful endorsement, which I, I really took a lot of comfort in that someone who's such an expert on um, the details felt that I did justice to them in the book. Um, but yes, I, I, I didn't think I, I certainly couldn't outdo Taylor Downing in terms of writing a nonfiction book, but I felt because I lived some of the events personally and, and I knew I didn't know Petrov, unfortunately never got to meet him, but I knew Lenny Perutz reasonably well. Um, I thought that I could bring something that uh, in a dramatization that um, might be a unique perspective on on the events, and and I was I'm hoping also that a book like mine, which I think is a, I think it's a fairly fun read, or it's a, even though it's it's about very unfun topics, will reach a wider audience and and make more people aware of those events and how potentially horrific they were, uh, and I and I think. Many of the early readers, Ian, have made the connection between that I have written and what's going on today and the potentiality for miscalculation and for not managing the crisis properly. And I, I've had um, endorsements from, again, early readers. I mentioned Taylor Downey, but an, another one from um, former Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates and and Bob Gates really zeroed in on that piece of, of the story that this there are lessons for policy makers today in reading this and, and understanding how that crisis was managed. Um, and another another early reader is Admiral James Stavridis, who was NATO Allied Supreme Commander and um, is a highly regarded observer and, and analyst of events today. And he's here in the States. He's on CNN and the other broadcast networks um, every day. And, and Stavridis wrote an endorsement. And he emphasized that point too, that policymakers, people that are in the arena now should would do well to read a book like this. And, but yeah, and your book is very relevant to that. And, you know, I think, I think it's a, it's a great read. As you say, it's it's a serious subject, but I found it quite a you know, an easy read. And I don't mean it in a dumbing down sort of way, but it was, you know, it, it flowed well, really strong characters in there. 
a crossover of real people and the fictional characters as well. So I appreciate your kind words about the book. And I would also note that I am writing a series of books with, with the two main characters in each book with Captain, well, he becomes promoted <laughs> over time, but Kevin Katani and, uh, and Ivan Levchenko. The next book in the series, the, the major event that it kind of folds around is the Soviet war in Afghanistan. And uh, then the book after that, the major event that it pivots around is the fall of the Berlin wall. And it's in that third book that I introduce uh, a new character into the series. And that's Vladimir Putin in <laughs> his role as a KGB Dresden. Colonel in Dresden. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. So he and Levchenko uh, meet and work together in East Germany as things are falling apart. And, um, and then in the, the fourth book folds itself around uh, the, the Persian Gulf war uh, of 1991 and uh, in which, as I did research on it, the Russians really had a fairly major role, even though they, they were a non-combatant, but they, uh, they attempted to be the mediator between the alliance and, uh, and Saddam Hussein in a very meaningful way. It's really quite interesting. So I get Levchenko mixed up in that. And, um, and then the, the book I'm writing now, the fifth book, um, it, it's going to kind of end with the 9-11 attacks, but um, it begins with the war in Kosovo in 1999. And it, it it's really the ascension of Putin is a major theme of, of this fifth book. You know, the, the book is great, but to, to also hear from somebody who was having to look at some of this stuff while it was happening and, and, see people make make these decisions as to do we fire do we not fire yeah. and that line from uh donnelly what, what was it i'm not going to start world war three this afternoon <laughs> or something yeah is 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 brilliant and i mean with with lenny perutz i mean that's really because you always see these dour official photos of these people and you never really get to know what their personality is like and you certainly don't think of them as cracking jokes all the time and because i think on one of your sites you he he tells you to not be too cocky or something doesn't he yeah he did well it's it's yeah it's actually in it's in the able archers when i first and this is this is a story i channeled because it actually happened <laughs> with lenny perutz um i have it happening in at ramstein in germany um where but it actually happened in the pentagon but uh, when I first went to work for him, um, and I, I, I'll tell the real story, but it's it's a, a, there's an analog to it in the book. But the real story is that Lenny had just become chief of Air Force Intelligence. He it was not long after the Able Archer incident. It was just months after that, and um, and he I can't remember the timing exactly, but in any event, I was I was on the air staff, which is the headquarters of the air force in the Pentagon. And, um, I was still a young captain and, uh, and I was on, uh, I was worked in current intelligence. And one of our roles was to brief the chief of staff of the air force and his staff at their, at their staff meetings, which occurred three days a week. And then, we'd also brief the secretary of the air force and so on and so forth. But, um, so I w I just happened to be the briefer the morning that Lenny showed up for his first day as chief of air force intelligence. And we had a small briefing team. We had three or four guys that would rotate, but, and I was very much the most junior guy. Um, and, so Lenny must have been, I, I, I briefed him for the first time before we would brief the chief of staff. We have a briefing for, of the same briefing with each morning with the chief of air force intelligence. And I think Lenny was a bit taken aback that this very young captain was one of his briefers. And, 
he was very skeptical of me and, you know, I don't know if this is going to work out and, you know, you're awfully young and you, you're not only young, you look younger than you, you actually are, <laughs> which is bad. <laughs> and uh, so in any event, he, I went down to the tank with him in the bowels of the Pentagon and I gave my briefing and there were the chief of staff, of the air force asked a couple of questions and I answered the questions and, and then I went back to my office and was I, doing my little debrief that I had to do with the, with the colonels that I worked for and my phone rings on my desk, my direct line. And I pick it up and it's general Perutz. And he, he yells gruffly into the phone, get the hell down to my office immediately. And uh, so I, I hung up the phone and I was nonplussed. And uh, I told the colonels that general Perutz had just told me to come down to see him. <laughs> and then I, so I'm walking down the a ring of the Pentagon, the innermost ring of the Pentagon toward his office and other colonels are coming out of the woodwork asking me what happened, what you must've really screwed up. He's angry. And, <laughs> sort of thing. and, uh, and then I get into his outer office and his deputy, who was a one-star general intercepts me and says, you know, this is really bad. Uh, I'm very disappointed in you and this sort of thing. And he said, you know, what went wrong? I kept saying nothing went wrong. I don't, I don't know what the fuss is about. And in any event, and the one-star general come, went into Perutz's office with me, and Perutz had this very large office. And um, so we both stand in front of his desk, and Perutz is reading something, and he looks up, and he looks at me. He looks at the one-star general, looks back at me, and asks me, what the hell is he doing here? What's this general doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and so the general says, well, sir, you know, we heard there were some problems. I just want to make sure actions taken to rectify them. And so Perutz looks at him and he says, I don't need you get the hell out of my office. <laughs> and so I'm standing there alone and, uh, and Perutz just goes back to reading like he's forgotten. I'm even there. And after it was probably not very long a time, but it seemed long to me. He looked up at me and he goes, so how do you think it went down there? And I said, I think it went fine. I think it was just fine. It was just an average briefing. Everything went fine. I answered the questions and he said, yeah, okay. I agree with you. I think it was great. I don't think it was fine. I think it was great. It was really good. Okay. So don't change anything that you're doing. And make sure you continue to prepare like you've been preparing for the, you know, you've prepared for today. Mm. And, uh, and I said, okay. And is that all, sir? And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's it. Get out, get back to work. You know? So I, I'm walking out of his office and I'll remember this till I die. I, I had my hand on the door handle and I was about to walk out and he says, Oh, one more thing, captain. And I turned around and he says, don't get too cocky. <laughs> Brilliant. So that was, wow. that was Lenny. Yeah. So I, I described that maybe not as long as I just, I know that was a lengthy description I just made, but uh, it's, there's a scene in the book where I'm at Ramstein with him and he does essentially the same thing to Oh, well, you, you, you built that up well. That was, you know, it, I, I was wondering what he was going to say. So uh, that worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. But he was he was a character and I we all miss him. I have so enjoyed talking to you tonight. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Well, it's it's really been funny. And thank you for making it fun and, and um, allowing me to ramble on as I've done, but, uh, it's, it's, it's an important story. I, I do think it has relevance for today and I just, I hope people read it. I, I, yeah, I hope they do. And I hope they like the characters and because it is largely character driven and, and it, I wanted to humanize the people involved in these situations also. That was another intent I had. And I, I hope I've in some small way accomplished that. <laughs>
Now, do check out our episode notes where there will be links to buy Brian's book and more information about the events of 1983. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous patrons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.